My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick! This was not addressed to Scrooge or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for once again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of greed and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye, which showed the passion that had taken root and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a mourning dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that came from the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you, he rejoined. A golden one. <laughs> this is the even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, she answered gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then? He returned. Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. <laughs> she shook her head. Well, am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so until in good season we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made... You are another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feelings tell you that you were not what you are, she returned. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly, but with steadiness upon him, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? <laughs> ah, <laughs> no. He seemed to yield to the justice of this supposition in spite of himself. If you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who in your very confidence with her weigh everything by gain. Or choosing her, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you. With a full heart for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed, You may, the memory of what is past half makes me hope you will, have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy, 
in the life you have chosen. She left him and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more, exclaimed the ghost. No more, said Scrooge. No more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place. A room. Not large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful girl, so like the last that Scrooge believed it was the same, until he saw her, now a comely matron, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count. And unlike the celebrated herd in the poem, there were not 40 children conducting themselves as one, but every child was conducting itself like 40. The consequences were uproarious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. Well, on the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much. The latter, soon beginning to mingle in the sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. Oh, but now a knocking at the door was heard and such a rush immediately ensued that she, with laughing face and plundered dress, was borne toward it, the centre of a flushed and boisterous group, just in time to greet the father, who came home, attended by a man laden down with Christmas toys and presents. Then the shouting and the struggling and the onslaught that was made on the defenceless porter, the scaling him with chairs for ladders to dive into his pockets, to spoil him of brown paper parcels, hold tight by his cravat, hug him round the neck, pummel his back and kick his legs in irrepressible affection. The shouts and wonder and delight with which every parcel was received. The terrible announcement that the baby, having been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan into its mouth and was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued to a wooden platter. Oh, the immense relief of finding that this was a false alarm. <laughs> the joy and gratitude, the ecstasy, they are all indescribable alike. Ah, <sighs> it is enough that by degrees the children and their emotions got out of the parlour and by one stair at a time up to the top of the house where they went to bed and so subsided. <laughs> and now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever when the master of the house having his daughter leaning on him fondly, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. And when he thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and full of promise, might have called him father, and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed, Bell, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile. I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. <laughs> How can I? Tut, I don't know. She added in the same breath, laughing as he laughed. <laughs> Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge, it was. I passed his office window. And as it was not shut up and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear. And there he sat alone, quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice, remove me from this place. I told you these were but shadows of things that have been, said the ghost, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. 
He turned upon the ghost and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which in some strange way there were fragments of all the faces that had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! In the struggle, if it can be called a struggle in which the ghost was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright and dimly connecting that with its influence over him. He seized the extinguisher cap and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. <sighs> he was conscious of being exhausted and overcome with an irresistible drowsiness and further of, of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed and barely had time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. <sighs> That's the end of stave two. Is this all?